Greetings, and welcome to Comedic Legacy Today, the new weekly series presented by the Center for the Restoration of Ma'at. My name is Heru Jeden Ma'at Aten Ra, also more commonly known as Jabari Osaze. And my name is Anika Daniels Osaze, also known as Unfurka Ma'at. The Center for the Restoration of Ma'at is a new organization. Anika, why don't you tell us a little bit more about the Center? Okay. The Center is an organization whose focus is to bring back the comedic legacy. Now, what do I mean by comedic? Comedic is the ancient term for Egypt, as we know uh, commonly today. The spiritual uh, meaning behind the comedic legacy is to be at one with the divine creator. It's not a religion per se, it's a spiritual understanding and a way of life. So what our purpose is with the Center is to help everyone understand how to return to that comedic legacy, to return to that way of life. And as we focus um, with comedic legacy today, I, I have to say you're in for a great treat. Um, our weekly series is the Journal of Ancient African Spirituality and History, and certainly um, we'll focus primarily on ancient Kemet. And in doing that, you can expect to see everything from um, hosts as we go into talk show format. You're going to hear from incredible uh, spoken word artists. You're going to uh, see some incredible musical acts. We are going to bring you the full flavor of ancient Africa and ancient Kemet. And so having said that, today uh, we figured that the best thing for us to do would be to start with a, a very basic understanding of ancient Egyptian or Kemetic spirituality. So today, Anika and I will be discussing the seven basic principles of comedic spirituality. Principle one is known as the one in the many. Uh, generally, when we hear about ancient Egyptian spirituality, we hear about um, polytheism, we hear about a blinding array of deities or gods, as some people may call them, and often these things can become very confusing for um, anyone who isn't very familiar with ancient Kemetic spirituality. It's very important for us to recognize that the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Kamites, viewed the divine force as one basically indescribable force that differentiated itself into different faculties or powers. And so often when we talk about the one in many, most people begin um, the discussion with um, Akhenaten or, or Ankhenaten, who um, some people uh, say is the father of monotheism. But clearly, if, you have, if you're more familiar with the work of the um, Cushitic kings in the 25th dynasty, you'll become even more familiar with the fact that the ancient Egyptians always viewed their divine force as one single being. In fact, as we talk about the 25th dynasty, there's a really wonderful description of the divine power in ancient Egypt um, that has been recorded on what most people call the Shabaka stone. Shabaka is one of the Nsubiti, or pharaohs, as you may have heard um, commonly known today, um, who comes forth from south of Egypt, of Kemet, and um, as he becomes the ruler of ancient Kemet, he decides that he's going to do something very curious for someone that m what most people consider a foreign leader. He's going to begin to describe um, comedic philosophy, comedic spirituality from its essence. And so he actually goes back to one of the documents that he considers worm-eaten. Um, that is, when he found it, it was in horrible condition. And he has it rewritten. This, this document is now known as the Shabaka Stone and is often um, the best description and the earliest description of the divine force in, in our world. I mean, in that description, he describes Ptah. Ptah, this divine force that comes out of nothingness. Ptah is the creative force. And it said that he was a blacksmith. Um, and in doing that, uh, in, the, in the description called the creation of Ra as Ptah, um, and we'll talk more about this in future episodes, Ptah actually whittles each of these divine forces, these principles, from Asar, or known as Osiris, or Heru, known as, um, as, as Horus. He whittles them together 
creates them, and in doing that, he creates these divine forces that we're more familiar with. And at the end of this entire description, he goes back and reminds us that each of them are nothing but the teeth, the hands and the feet of this one divine force. So it's a really wonderful description of the one in many. Okay. Now when we talk about the one in many, we also have to understand the force from within. What you'll find in our show is that we spend a lot of time trying to use the comedic terms. It's very important to use the language of your ancestors and to make sure that you don't offend them in any way. So we tend to use some of the Greek terminology that you've heard just because it's something you're familiar with, but we'll definitely tell you the original comedic terms. So when we talk about the force from within, many of you would say that that's God. In the comedic faith, we call it inter or you might have heard it as Netcher or Netcheru. There's several ways of pronouncing it. What you'll find in the ancient language, uh, what some of you may have heard is hieroglyphics, uh, we call the Meru Netter or the Untu Inter, is that since vowels weren't used that frequently in the language, that just like in any language you'd have a dialect, there are people who may have pronounced it with different letters, uh, different vowels. So you'll see that there are different pronunciations. But for the purpose of this show, when we refer to God, we are using the term unter. So the unter is the divine creative force. That's the force that rules all things. And when we talk about all things and the divine creation within self, what we're saying is that the creator is everything. And that includes humans, that includes animals, that includes plants, that includes all things and that one can be a divine force. What you also need to realize is that when we talk about inter, that force is both female and male. So the, the divine force in itself, in the spelling of the word, the T being the feminine principle and the R being the masculine principle, we are, we are discussing our creator as both masculine and feminine. So with, when you're looking at your creator, you're looking at yourself. And that's one important thing to realize when you're talking about the spiritual force. That's a, a, a really good description. Um, those of you who, are, who um, become familiar with this show will really enjoy um, Anika's descriptions of the language of the Medunetter, as she is one of the few people that is actually able to speak the language. And so we're going to go in depth into language in future episodes as well. Um, just want to add another point with the force um, from within. Um, there are so many different times that we see images in ancient Egypt or images from ancient Egypt and we're not really aware of what each of these symbols mean. And um, I always enjoy talking about um, what we now know as the Sphinx, which is actually called Heru Emanket mm -hmm. or Heru on the Horizon. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Heru, we'll talk more about Heru, but you'll notice that we ha our studio is Heru down today. <laughs> you'll see the Heru energy behind us and also on our tapestry. Um, Heru um, is that force that has to do battle with his animal self. Um, for those of you who don't know what that animal self is, um, think about that urge that has you grab for the second slice of cheesecake when you know that you only need one, or the urge that... Um, continues to allow you to stay in bed after your alarm goes off. It's that, that thing that forces you to do those things that you know are not necessarily the things that you should be doing. And so when we deal with that animal drive, we're looking at that large leonine or lion form in the form of the Sphinx or Hera Emanket. And you'll note that at the top you'll see a head of a human, a human with the cloth of royalty but also a head that is actually smaller, at least two-thirds smaller than the body itself. And so what we're really saying here is that in order to become a divine being, you have to refine this, this primal animal self into um, the divine human self. And mm -hmm. so um, that is the, the meaning behind the great beast, Heru Emanket. Mm -hmm. Principle three is, is something I like to call blessing in balance. Um, and you'll note that if you are familiar with ancient Kemetic spirituality, the Kemites actually described um, their spiritual factors uh, as always needing to either be in balance or return to balance. And um, this great form of balance is known as ma'at. 
you'll note that Ma'at is so important to us that we actually named our center the Center for the Restoration for Ma'at after um, this, this wonderful uh, goddess. And it's also in my name. <laughs> and it's in her name as well. I knew she was going to mention that, by the way. Um, as we look at Ma'at, this woman that wears this feather, a feather is actually an ostrich feather like the one that Anika is holding. Um, she, she wears this feather on her head, and it's a reminder that in the end, your soul, your deeds, your acts must be weighed against the feather. So that um, we're going to talk a little bit more about the judgment scene later on in the show, but your heart must be lighter than a feather for you to enter into the Hall of Ma'ati, or what most, most of us would call heaven today. Ma'at is also known um, for seven principles, truth, justice, balance, order, reciprocity, harmony, and righteousness. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you may actually think that she's quite familiar, particularly all of you who are in the legal system. You might say, well, isn't she the woman that holds the scales? Yes, she is. But in the ancient comedic legacy, they didn't believe that she should be blind. So you won't see her blindfolded. Um, but definitely, this is the archetype for Lady Justice that we see in Western society. So the ancient Egyptians always believed that things had to return to balance. And when things were out of balance, things were in chaos. And when things are in chaos, those are when those extremely negative things happened to their nation, to their community, and even to the individual. And so each day, a Kemite would begin their day by reciting what are known as the 42 negative confessions of Ma'at by saying that they weren't going to do certain things during the day, and then they'd end their day by um, saying that they had not done those things, and if they had, they would ask for divine forgiveness at that mm -hmm. point. And so Ma'at is a critical principle, and once again, um, we hope that you'll become much more familiar with the principle of Ma'at um, through our series, Comedic Legacy, today. Okay. Now, in order to reach Ma'at, it's important to realize that there are several tools to the path of spiritual development. And that's something that the center is in place to help you with. First thing you need to do is pray. We should all be familiar with that, regardless of what spiritual background you have, what religion you follow, whether it be Hinduism or Judaism, everyone should understand the basic philosophy of prayer. And it should be done every day, and not just for yourself, but for others and for not just today, but for the future. So in your prayers, as you're doing your 42 uh, laws each day and you talk about the things that you will not do and the things that you, you also talk about what you hope to do, uh, what you'd like to see for your life and for your family and for your friends and people who are close to you. The next important tool is ritual and ceremony. Just like in a Baptist church, you go to church on Sundays, you have certain hymns that you should be reciting. In the spiritual faith, in the comedic faith, there are different rituals and practices. And you'll see one um, a little bit later on in the show that we follow each morning when you wake up between usually the hours of between four and six when you're most vibrant in the mornings. You would wake up and you would do your best to recite the different areas of um, necessity in your life. One thing you'll hear about would be the canopic jars, the children of Heru. The fact that when uh, someone goes on into the next realm where they're deceased, the different organs were taken from their body and placed into different jars. And each of those jars had a meaning or a semblance. And each of those organs were taken for a particular reason. And those organs uh, would be blessed upon in those canopic jars. So, and each one would have a name. When we're doing what we call the opening of the way, you're actually referring to each of those body parts as divine body parts. It's important to realize your body is your temple, and each part of your body should be uh, honored, and it should be recognized each day. So you're not just asking for your health, but for your clarity. So that's something that would be done in ritual and ceremony. Now, Study is very important. It's important for you to read, and not just to read anything about ancient Egypt or about the Kemetic legacy, but it's also important to read other books of faith, to understand that we all come from a basic uh, background, that we have a function, a, fo a focus that all comes from the same creator, the same divine being, and that we're all on the same page. Meditation is very important. 
And I, I'm sure that many people do that regardless of the faith that they're in. But when you're meditating, it's important to realize that to be at your highest point of meditation, it also includes what you eat and what your diet is. And that you need to focus on the lighter you eat, the better you can meditate and the closer you become to the divine being. And finally, spiritual discipline. Realizing that this needs to be done every day, not just one day of the week. And that it is important that you do this on a regular basis and make this a practice in your everyday life. Certainly, um, Anika has actually uh, shared with us some really important tools on your path to spiritual enlightenment. Um, and I always say that um, it's easier, and, and I think that each of us will probably find that certain aspects of these tools are probably easier for us. And it's important for you to continue to work on the other ones that are not as easy. For example, I, I tend to have a little more difficulty with quieting my mind. Um, Anika, my, my, my divine reflection, constantly says, do you always need to have the television on? Um, and uh, <laughs> sometimes my, my embarrassed response is yes. Um, and so it's, it's important sometimes to still the mind, um, to think about returning within. Because if we believe that we are divine vessels, then virtually everything in this entire universe is within us. And so going within is perhaps the greatest school, the greatest teaching um, uh, forum that we can actually enter. And so uh, we have actually some footage of, of an incredible ritual. Um, and perhaps it's also a shameless plug because um, the ritual is um, part of um, our Hebs Maitawi or our, um, our wedding ceremony that was done um, a little bit more than eight years ago. Um, and you'll see our chief priest, um, the person that we go to for spiritual guidance, um, uh, he will actually go through um, the opening of the way. Um, and he does it in an interesting and unique format because he actually does it in libation. And those of you who are filming this during the Kwanzaa period, you certainly are familiar with libations. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to see uh, this libation done in the form of uh, the opening of the way. Um, and so with that, I, I think we should go to this particular footage. And you, some of you may be familiar with our priest as well from the Shrine of Ma'at. It's Baba Heru Ankara Samaj Se Pata. Uh, so you, you've probably seen him. You may also be familiar with his mate, Queen Afua. And this, he, here we have him actually performing the ceremony. In Africa, our ancestors call libation to purify the atmosphere. Now many other cultures have taken this on as a beautiful thing to do. So I'm going to libate to the divine angelic guardians of the four directions. Periodically, I will say tuau inter, and when I say tuau inter, you may join me in saying tuau inter. To a who inter, you're speaking in your ancient African language, it means glory to the divine. You always honor the divine in everything that we do, this African spirituality. Get 
Welcome back. Um, you, you just saw an incredible ritual um, performed, and we're going to also have um, this, this wonderful divine person on the show so that he'll be able to describe um, his approach to ancient Kemetic spirituality, and, and we hope to do that in, in upcoming episodes. Um, let's move on um, to principle five, which I always call sacred myth, sacred message. Um, and uh, I think that when we think about myth, it's critically important for us to remember that myth is that which is not true, but which is always true. And so it's, it's very, very important for us to recognize that we've been taught in, in school that myth is something that primitive minds created because they weren't able to understand the true genesis of so many things in our world. And in actuality, that is, that takes away all the spiritual and, and, um, and relevatory dimension from all of these great myths. Um, and in contrast, think about what history is. History is that which was once true. So that in some ways, myth is more powerful than history because myth, myth is that which is always true. And history is that which was once true. Um, and so it's, it's critically important for us to remember that. Um, I, I like to always talk about some of the things that are um, some of the books that are on my bookshelf, um, some of the things I'm going through, and I, I certainly um, am enjoying reading Tom Harper's The Pagan Christ. He goes through great myths in the Bible and describes what the um, deeper spiritual meaning might actually be. And so um, it really is powerful to be able to see his description of it. But clearly it's very difficult today to talk about myth and not talk about the man who um, actually brought myth back to public consciousness, and that would be the amazing Joseph Campbell, who um, unfortunately died in 1987. Um, Joseph Campbell is um, uh, one of the most important uh, proprietors of, of sacred myth from all across the world. So I, I'd say to you that if you're able to pick up anything that he's done, including the wonderful PD, PBS documentary, it'll certainly be worth it. And so myth is um, the kind of story that um, encapsulates, that ensconces great spiritual teaching. Um, we're going to talk a lot about myth, great myth, um, in, over the course of the show, particularly the most important myth um, of the story of Ast, Asar, and Heru, um, perhaps the world's most um, earliest and most important deity, and so, uh, uh, Trinity, and so, um, we're certainly going to talk a, a bit more about that um, as we move on as well. One thing you'll find ab about the comedic legacy is that there are symbols everywhere. And what you'll realize is someone who's becoming initiated into the comedic faith will see things in ways that they've never seen them before. You'll realize that these symbols were always there, but they, they have new meaning to them. One great example would be the symbol of the Ankh, which my mate carries with him all the time. This is a meditation ankh, and it represents the symbol for life. Now, why do we say that it represents the symbol of life? Most people who look at this would just say, well, it looks like a cross or similar to a cross. And yes, that's true. That's something, it could be considered to be one of the earliest crosses that existed. Now, in this particular symbol, we have the top piece, which is kind of rounded and looks like a womb or what we say would be the womb, or the feminine principle. The bottom part, or what we would consider to be the shaft, would be the masculine principle. 
and then you would have the, the offspring coming from the sides. So what does that mean? This is the ultimate symbol for regeneration, rebirth, for life, for offspring, and for uh, generation. So it's important to realize that when you look at it from the eyes of someone who may not have seen an Ankh before, you may see one thing, but once you start understanding the comedic legacy, you'll see that it's much deeper. I know when we go on the different uh, tours held by Tony Browder in DC, you'll realize that when you're looking at the city, it looks like any other city to you. But when you actually look at the different symbols that are facing you, many of the people would say, well, the Masons created a lot of that. But where did the Masons get that information? It's actually African spirituality and ancient African symbols that you're looking at. And it may not mean much to you right now, but through the different episodes that we have on our show, we'll actually start explaining to you what those symbols actually mean and why those particular symbols were used in creating the city of D.C. So you'll see that there's symbols all over and that they'll have so much more meaning to you once you start delving into this comedic legacy. And in actuality, Anika, um, that's a really important description of the Ankh because most people will say that the Ankh is a symbol of life but they don't actually understand why it's a symbol of life. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're seeing um, the recognition of male and female order mm -hmm. and, and balance and the importance of family. Mm -hmm. And I always say to brothers, brothers, keep in mind that you can clearly tell which symbol is on top. And so um, ancient Kemet is a matrilineal order, and, and so that is the way that um, they would have viewed the world. The, the, the feminine principle is critically important in a description of philosophy or spirituality. Um, and um, also, I, I just want to say that um, one of the reasons why these symbols can become so difficult to understand um, is because what we're actually doing is we're trying to understand something that the highly initiated would have understood. And so symbol could mean something to the general public, mm -hmm. but it certainly meant something very, very different to individuals who are, who are the initiated, who had spent as many as 42 years in a temple mm -hmm. um, attempting to learn um, and attempting to build on their spiritual development until they yeah. were able to be the final stage of initiate or, or chief priest. And at that stage, all of this world of sacred symbolism would be open and revealed to them and they'd be able to access it for their, for their lives. That's one of the reasons why we talk about um, the Ankh and, and symbolism as being critically important um, in understanding um, the world of ancient Kemet. But we, keep in mind that we're not here simply for history. We're here to teach you hopefully some symbols and some um, practices that will help you understand how to live a more divine life. Something that could even bring it more to light for you. Uh, my mate and I actually went to see the Avatar. I know that movie just came out and you know from a simple standpoint you look at the Avatar and you think you know this is a great movie with a lot of graphics um, it may even seem like it's a, a love story to some extent um, a battle of great truth or challenges but from the standpoint where we see it we understand that it actually is an example of ancient mystery systems and initiation rites the fact that when you look at the main character, he has to go through four different initiations to actually become a great warrior. One, starting off where he's going into the earth, his first steps when he becomes the avatar, he st sticks his feet into the ground. That means he's finally entering the earth. Then when he's escaping from that wild beast, he actually jumps into the water. So that's his next step of initiation. Then when he learns how to fly that creature, He's actually entering the air. And finally, when he has to fight to save their village, and it's actually in flames, that's his birthright. That's his next step into the fire. And he's actually learning to become reborn as a warrior when he finishes all four of those stages and enters the community and becomes part of that new community. I would actually say that he does even something more than um, becoming a member of a particular community. In actuality, what's happening is he is becoming a divine vessel, and that's the reason mm -hmm. why he's able to make the move, the transition from the material world mm -hmm. to the spirit world. Remember, um, for those of you who have seen the film, 
and it seems like a lot of people have because it's doing quite well. <laughs> um, for those of you who have seen the film, you'll take note that after he goes through each of those initiations, the next thing that happens is that he has to gasp for air. Mm -hmm. And you might actually think, well, it's an interesting story and, and um, that, that's, that's, that's great. It fits in very well with the, the entire myth. But keep in mind that the first thing that a baby does when they're born is grasp for air. And so they're making a commentary about him being reborn. And then right after gasping for air and being able to have air, he is seated on the lap. Folks, this is a spoiler alert. He's <laughs> seated on the lap of this um, woman who is a Navi. And so she's, she's much larger than him. And he's seated on her lap. And he almost looks like a child. And so they're referencing the great image of the Madonna and child, which has its origins in ancient Kemet and comes through many different spiritual forms as well. And so that's really what we're seeing. We're seeing the transition from matter to spirit. Um, and um, we're going to talk a lot more about um, the mystery systems that came out of Kemet, came out of Egypt, and went into other portions of the world and found their way into the great spiritual, the three great spiritual forms um, that um, are in practice today. Finally, finally, we have to talk about um, principle seven, which is the final judgment. And in actuality, every um, ancient Egyptian, every Kamite believed that in the end, when we go to meet our, meet our maker, we are going to be judged by our deeds. Now, what does that mean? That means that um, while some of you might um, focus on saying um, the name of the right divine force, the ancient Kamites actually believed that what was important was your deeds. And so your deeds, as you, if you look at the final judgment scene of Ani, your deeds are what give you a light heart. And as you have that light heart, heart that heart is weighed against the feather of Ma'at. Mm -hmm. And in being weighed um, uh, at the, uh, against the feather of Ma'at, this would actually decide whether you were sacred, divine, and rectified, what we would call Ma'keru. Um, truer voice. And being truer voice, you'd then be able to enter into the Hall of Ma'ati. Now, let's say, some of you might say, well, you know, if I'm being judged by my deeds, you know, there's some days I might have done some things that I really shouldn't have done. And so does it mean that regardless of what I've done in my past, that um, I'm still going to be judged for it, regardless of whether I do incredible, wonderful um, giving things in, in my present and in my future? And the answer would have to be no. As you look at the image of the judgment of Ani, you'll take note of the fact that um, at the top you will see 12 Nteru, or Neteru, or Netchers, as some people would say. And those 12 Netchers actually have, some will have an Ankh up, and some of them will, have, um, will not have the Ankh up. And in, essentially what they're doing is, when the heart is, supposed to, is actually equal to the feather, then it goes to the jury. Yes, this is the origin of the concept of trial by jury. But um, this jury would then decide whether you were Makeru, and you would be able to be true of voice and enter into the Hall of Ma'ati. Now, keep in mind that all of these principles operate on several different levels. Mm -hmm. And as I say they operate on several different levels, this is not just a great spiritual allegory for um, our edification um, in a future time, but every person who was following comedic spirituality would have actually gone through the 42 laws, the 42 negative confessions of Ma'at, and in doing that, they would actually um, be practicing um, the preparation for judgment every day, because of course, as we lay our heads on, into our bed, to some degree, we're actually going into, into the period of death. And then we wake in the morning, we're reborn again. And so this judgment takes place on a daily basis. The way I look at it is um, making sure you have it right each day um, will allow you to have it right when your final judgment comes to you. And so um, the final judgment is a, a, a critically important principle um, in ancient comedic spirituality. With that, we've gone through our seven basic principles. Now, clearly we were talking about a spiritual form that developed over the course of 5,000 years. Yeah. And so giving you seven basic principles might actually be, uh, seem like we're giving you short shrift, and, and I'm sure we have. But hopefully this will give you a beginning 
an mm -hmm. entree into the world of ancient Kemetic spirituality. Mm -hmm. And then from there, what you'll be able to do is be able to understand these great spiritual principles and use them in your everyday life. Because ultimately, that is what we are about. We're about trying to use these principles so that we may become divine beings, so we may actually reconstruct and heal the planet that we live on, so that we can um, create the kinds of relationships in our community that are edifying, mm -hmm. that um, are, are divine. And so we hope that this um, was edifying and divine to you. Um, I should say a, a quick note, we're going to end um, today's uh, uh, episode with a piece by an incredible poet, um, beloved Ola Jendai, and, and um, I'm looking forward to hearing the piece that he's crafted for us, and so we're going to, to, um, to welcome him and recognize um, the, the wonderful creativity that went into the piece that he's provided for us. Beloved. Ola Jendai. Folks, as I told you, you're really in for a treat. Uh, you'll note that Comedic Legacy today is going to be much more than a talk show, much more than a variety show. It's going to be all those things. And we're looking forward to bringing you not only some of the, the great um, scholars and spiritualists in our community, um, but we're also looking to bring you some of the um, great performers and artists in our community. And so today, we have the wonderful blessing of having a brother that I've known virtually as long as I've known myself, brother, beloved Ola Jendai. And I, he's going to beat me up for this, but I'll tell you that um, I'm so pleased to have him because quite as it's kept, he's probably one of the world's best spoken word artists. His work is, is well-renowned, and I'm really looking forward to being blessed by the pieces that he's going to bring for you. Um, belo brother, beloved, come on in here. Yeah, it's a tap, a tap, a tap. Peace and a blessings. Tap, tap. Peace and blessings. Peace and blessings. Yes, indeed. Now, I'm going to tell you, I've, I've known this brother virtually all my life. And um, the thing that's amazing um, for me in having him be part of this show is that, um, uh, you know, uh, the three of us, and I'll say the three of us because you know that there's another leg to the stool, another right. brother that is here today. Um, but you can't see him, he's not on camera. He's a, a, another wonderful brother. The three of us grew up together, and we got a chance to see your talent, your spoken word artistry develop. And as children, at first, we thought it was quite funny that you were devoting all the time that you did to your work. But we got an opportunity to see you blossom. And even as, as children, we were able to recognize the genius that you were bringing to it. And so the laughter began to be applause and admiration. And so I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to be able to have you on, um, for you to be able to share some of that with us. That's why. That's why I'm Definitely. And so with that, I give you, Brother Beloved, all agenda. Hey, what's up? Uh, peace and blessings. I definitely want to thank uh, Jabari and Anika um, for inviting me to participate in this um, wonderful experience, Comedic Legacy today. And um, I think I share a little song with you today. How about that? Is that fine? All right. Hmm. More than myth, more than MCs lifting consciousness, must become change, we all insist, must come someday, might as well be now, so light your fire. And take your light to higher ground. And blow like Joshua, blow around Jericho. For all we know, Babylon must fall. Might as well, might as well be now. Might as well, might as well be now. Mother, Father, Creator, please forgive me, for it's been a long time since I've had a conversation with you. Took a moment to reflect, to recognize, acknowledge your, our omnipresence and indwelling. I have been guilty of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. In my attempts to separate self from slave theocracies and, and giving up external gods who neither resembled nor respected me, my genealogy, for they required my fear, 
I forget sometimes to recognize the divine within, to appreciate the miracle of the everyday, to give thanks to knowing that despite all this disconnectedness that seems to run this world, all things are connected. And even at their worst, there is indeed another way. So forgive me and my cynicism and all that it has become. I do not come to you with my petty temporal requests, nor do I respect or expect you to provide me a response. I will seek you in the wind, in the songs of birds, in the next sunset, sunrise, in hearts out of the mouths of others, of babies, of babes, mostly. I shall endeavor to respect you, to love unconditionally, to continue to perfect myself, to grow, live, love, expand, honor my ancestors, ignite the Christ within to experience all that life has to offer, to know myself, to heal myself, to be myself, to love myself, and by extension, the same for others. I vouch my life to leaving this plane of existence more beautiful than the way that I found it, inherited it, to maximize the power of my talents. I will endeavor to be consistent, to allow myself to be vulnerable, to not have to know and have all the answers, to not be consumed by my own ego. So thoroughly attached to my own emotions, keep me, breathe through me, let my circle be unbroken. And all of your intelligent design, I am thankful, knowing to one day soon, it will all make sense. I am perfect as I am, I am that we are. Tuan Tu, it's up. Ayo, ayo. We don't need no instrumental, yo, this part is fundamental. After all ancestors been true, we need to cipher every word. Ayo, ayo, we the problem, the solution. Don't succumb to the pollution. Ain't gonna be no revolution unless we agitate, educate, and organize. Ayo, ayo, yo, we water and we spirit. Make me hollow when I hear it. Freedom taken, never given. Throw that vision, come again, this evening living. Ayo, ayo. Ain't gonna be no instrumental. <laughs> Yo, this part is fundamental. There's a truth that comes essentially. We responsible for free and we. Ayo, ayo. We the problem, the solution. Elevate your evolution. And seek ye all your old conclusions. Let love guide you on your way. Yo, 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 yo. Yo, yo, yo. Yo, 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 yo. Yo, yo, yo. We don't need no instrumental. Cause this part is fundamental. After all, ancestors spin to, we need to. Cipher every word. Twanta. Wow, bless. Oh, wow, wow. Beautiful. It's up, it's up. Beautiful, beautiful, yes, beautiful. Yes. Total, total. Yes. I, I really want to thank you for yes, that, yes. for the wonderful pieces that, that you um, brought forth. Um, and want to ask you what, what you're up to next. I don't uh, get to ask you this part of it very often because we're also talking about lots of other things. But that's right, man. So, so what, what are you up to next? Are you? Oh, man, I dream big, I tell you this, man. And, okay. And living into the dream is the biggest thing for me right now right. Um, to create possibility. Mm -hmm. I'm currently in transition. Um, I have been working on a manuscript that's um, tentatively titled Another Place Called There. Okay. And I've been kind of taking all these, this journey that we've been going through and finding and rediscovering ourselves and attempting to distill that and to be able to share that process with other folks. Mm -hmm. And I'm using the, the, the medium of, of song and short story and fiction and, and some, of, some of my blogs and for a while, for a number of years I've been blogging and I've kind of compiled some of that to, to create um, what is a, a place called there. I, I, I refer to also as essays and assonance. Mm -hmm. And um, I definitely some of, um, I guess my com experiences in comedic initiation has definitely fed that. Right. So, Wonderful. And, and I know that this is at least your set, second written work, correct? Yes. 
um, and, and the first one, Butterflies in Disguise. Yes. Is that still available? Um, we have a few limited copies. Limited. In other words, <laughs> folks, if you're interested, he's going to give you an email in a minute. If you're interested, you're going to need to get with him to, to um, see if you can get a copy of that. Um, what, how can people reach you? Um, probably the, the place I spend a lot more time now, and I'm almost ashamed to say it. Um, I'm at Facebook um, as Beloved. Yeah, and another um, Facebook junkie, folks. <laughs> it's spelled phonetically, so it's B-E-L-U-V-I-D. If you search on Facebook, you will find me. Right. Um, I was on MySpace for a while. Mm -hmm. um, some, you can, if, if you wanted to reach me by email, you, will send, you can send me a direct email at Beloved at Hotmail.com. That's B-E-L-U-V-I-D at Hotmail.com. And um, I don't think I've ever asked you this before um, mm -hmm. in all the years that I've known you. Um, where did you get the, the, the name Beloved from? This is the kicker. I mean, I've, I think I've been walking around with the same name my whole life. Um, it came from my mother, and I was named after an uncle. And it comes from David. That's my birth name. And David is the Anglican version of Dawood, mm. um, is Beloved of God. Right. right. And um, I know Dawood. <laughs> Is also you can trace it back to Kemet, um, you know, inside of Ta. Um, ta I'm, I'm going to jumble it right now, but you know, the beloved land, but also the beloved people. Mm -hmm. And so my name kind of brings it full circle inside of a comedic rendering. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful, so, beautiful. Well, brother, I want to I want to thank you for blessing us indeed. with a few verses again, and um, certainly uh, we hope to have you back on soon um, to drop a few other dimes with us. And we're hoping uh, to have another show where we'll actually have a live band. And um, I'm going to get him on camera to get some commitment from him here that he'll be <laughs> back for that show. Right? Is that something that you're interested in doing? I love creating, co-creating. And so positions. when you ask people on film, they obviously are going to say yes. So I want, thank you. Thank you. Right. Tua. Tua. All right, right now. Peace. Peace. Once again, folks, that's Comedic Legacy today. That was a wonderful piece by Brother Beloved Ola Jendai. Um, and we, we want to thank him so much for coming uh, to us and, and blessing us with his, um, his soulful words. Um, Those words of power. Hakao. Words of power. Hakao. Hakao. <laughs> and, you know, obviously um, her lead in is, is quite appropriate. We want to end each episode with words of power for you to use. And, of course, if you'd like to get this from us, you can email us at. Um, I guess I'll give them info, info at centerformaat.com. Um, Maat is spelled with two A's. It's M-A-A-T. And so if you email info at center, C-E-N-T-E-R, for Maat, M-A-A-T dot com, we'll, we'll email you um, the words for this. And it's so, important. It's the word for, not the number for. That's right. Yes. Yes. Why don't you begin with our prayer? Okay, so to begin with our words of power, or Hekau, we will do it in the ancient Kemetic language known as the Meru Netter, and then we will translate it for you in English. And keep in mind, this is the oldest prayer ever recovered, so you're actually going to your ancestors for spiritual guidance as they went to the divine force mm -hmm. for spiritual guidance. Amasu and Pa and Ter. Amasu and Pa and Ter. Sauksu. Sauksu. Ementra. Ementra. En pa enter. En pa enter. Autu aura. Autu aura. Maketi pa herura. Maketi pa herura. Give yourself to the one most high. Keep yourself daily for the divine. And do it tomorrow just as you do it today. Tuau enter. Praises to the Creator. And uh, we just want to make sure that you're aware that this is a weekly show. so. Look for us again next Saturday at, at high noon, uh, at 12 noon, and, and um, we'll hopefully have something that's even as, uh, just as edifying as today's episode wa uh, was for you. We should also let you know that if you're interested in any of the, the work of the Center for the Restoration of Ma'at, you can easily email us at info at centerforma'at.com. And we also have a tour of the Brooklyn Museum coming up on January 30th. So if you're interested, email us and we'll definitely let you know more about that. Yes. The focus will be uh, on ancient comedic pieces and looking at them from an African-centered point of view. Okay. With that, it's important for us to say that the divine force in us greets the divine force in you. Shem Hatep. Go forth in, in peace. peace.
We talked about Seshat, who is the female scribe. She is the complement to Tehuti, which is a scribe that many of us are familiar with. But we asked you, who does she look like that we've seen in the United States? When you look at her, is there any statue? There you go, exactly. Doesn't she remind you of the Statue of Liberty? Where do you think they got the concept from? What does the Statue of Liberty hold? A torch, and what else? And a book. What do you do with a book? You read a book, right? Somebody wrote the book. She's, a, she's the master scribe. That's where they got the concept for the Statue of Liberty. Now, we talked about Ma'at. And I mentioned to you that every day you have the opportunity to make up for the day that passed. Ma'at had 42 uh, confessions that you had to state every day as a Kenite. You would wake up in the morning and you would quote all 42. You'd start off by saying, I, have not done, I, I will not do wrong. I will not rob. I will not slay men. I will not speak lies. And at the end of the day, you had to be held accountable. So then you would have to go back through and say, I have not done wrong. I have not uh, afflicted any pain. I have not carried your food or spoken any lies. So who's responsible for your ultimate de destination? You are. Okay. The belief is that no one else can save you. You must save yourself. And that every day you have that responsibility. And yes, we slip up sometimes. But you have a, every day you have a day to be reborn. And every day you have that opportunity to relive. Now, how many of you looked up at the ceiling when you went into the tomb yesterday? Did you notice this on the ceiling? OK. Now, I don't see Athena here. Her daughter would appreciate this since her daughter's name is Heaven. The concept in the comedic faith is that the black woman is Heaven. They use a black woman to define heaven itself. So you'll see Newt stretched out upon the sky. And in the image that you saw, there was a sun that she actually swallowed that went all the way through her body. So she would swallow the sun at night, and it would travel through her body, and she would give birth to it again the next day. And you saw all the stars on the ceiling. Those were the stars of her body. Underneath her, holding her up, is her father, Shu. Shu is the breath. Shu is the fire. Shu is the air that we all breathe. <laughs> exactly. And underneath Shu, you'll see Geb. That's her mate. He lies underneath her. And what does he represent? Exactly, the ground, the earth. That's Geb. So now we talked about the fire, we talked about the air, we talked about earth. So what's missing? The fourth element, water. Her mother is Tefnut, which is moisture. She's not represented in this image, and you won't see her represented in too many places, but they write about her very often. And even some of the queens chose to represent themselves as Tefnut because they wanted to recognize the water element within themselves. Now, in studying ancient Kemet, you'll see that women had many more rights than some of us even have today in the United States. They had legal rights where they could manage and dispose of their own private property, which included land, portable goods. They had their own servants, animals, and their own money. It's like having your own bank account. They were able to do that in ancient Egypt. They had, their, they had marital rights where they can go into contracts for marriage, and they can even have a divorce. In some of our own religious beliefs right now, we cannot have divorces in these days and age. But they were able to have divorces at any time that they chose back in ancient Egypt. Lady Peseshet lived during the fourth dynasty and was credited as being the earliest known female physician in ancient Egypt. Her title was the Lady Overseer of Female Physicians. So her job was to actually look over all of the female physicians in ancient Kemet, and that they would come to her for guidance, and she would supervise their actions, and she would supervise their surgeries. Nebet, during the Sixth Dynasty, was, was called the vizier, a judge, and a, mas a magistrate. She was the, the grandmother of King Pepi I. 
so she was able to judge in court situations. Can you imagine a woman thousands of years ago being a judge, and now they're questioning whether we can have this Latino woman as a judge today? I mean, that's amazing. Why are we even questioning that? And all these women had the right to vote. We didn't get the right to vote till the 1920s. And we all mentioned before that in order for a man to become insubit, it had to go through the royal bloodline of the woman. So now let's talk about some of the female rulers that existed. So Bek Nefru was a female insubit as well. She's the third woman who may have ruled as a king during the 12th dynasty, and she was the daughter of Amenahat III. Queen Tuareset, or Tuareset, was the last known female insubit of Egypt, of local indigenous dynasty. Hatshepsut, I know we've spoken a lot about this great woman. She ruled from 1479 to 1458 BC, and was the fifth ruler of the 18th dynasty. She was actually the favorite of her father, of the many children that her father had. She was the daughter of Tutmos I and her mom, Ames. 